So today we're going to be looking at anxiety, mood and eating disorders. I'm Rebecca Atterworth, I'm a second year graduate and true medical student um, at Harris Manchester and my first degree was psychology which I did at New College. Um, so hopefully we can cover some of the stuff that you need to know for your exam today. So we're going to do anxiety disorders, mood disorders and eating disorders and kind of cover mostly about the classifications and epidemiology, some clinical features and there's a particular focus on talking therapies um, here because we did our psychopharmacology on Saturday. So if you missed that then I believe that it should be on the YouTube page for you to watch because we won't be covering any of the drugs today because we already did that. Um, but hopefully some of you are there for that as well. For anybody who wasn't here before there's the Socrative room and we'll get going. So we're going to start with anxiety disorders. So we've got our first Socrative question, which hopefully you can all see. So which one of these is a description of a phobia? Is it a marked fear of one or more social or performance situations, persistent fear that is excessive or unreasonable, um, caused by the presence or anticipation of a specific object or situation? Exposure to actual or threatened death or serious violence causing intrusive symptoms with recurrent involuntary and intrusive memories or recurrent unexpected panic attacks, which have an abrupt surge of intense fear or discomfort that reaches the peak within minutes. So the answer to that one is B, a persistent fear that is excessive or unreasonable caused by the presence or anticipation of a specific object or situation. And we're going to go through what the other ones are in a second. Um, on our next slide. Well, actually, we're going to go through this first. So um, this is the diagnostic categories that are generally used in psychology. And I just kind of wanted to cover the fact that they aren't as distinct as psychologists might like you to believe. So there's a huge amount of overlap between symptoms of different disorders and also of comorbidities that people have between different disorders. So it's really important to kind of get your head around that because a major problem in psychology is being able to categorise series of symptoms so there isn't as much crossover between disorders because otherwise we kind of end up in this weird wishy-washy world where there are distinct diagnoses but they massively overlap with each other. The treatments are the same but then they're treated differently because of different diagnoses. So it's a big problem within psychology but for the sake of learning it's easy to focus on them as separate entities but just so you know that they kind of aren't. Um, so we're going to go for the classification of anxiety disorders. So these are the ones in your syllabus. So generalised anxiety, which is the excessive worry, uh, more days than not for around six months with restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbance um, and significant distress. Um, yeah, and then also that there are common features which kind of go beyond general anxiety as well, which are autonomic features such as that feeling of fear or panic. And that's present in all the anxiety disorders and also excessive avoidance of things that they believe bring on those feelings. So in panic disorder, you have recurrent and unexpected panic attacks, which have an abrupt surge of intense fear or discomfort that reaches the peak within minutes which is the panic attack. And then this results in fear or recurrence and avoidance of whatever has caused their panic attack. And so a panic attack can involve any of these symptoms with palpitations, feeling like their heart is racing, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath, feeling like they're choking, chest pain, nausea, dizziness, numbness and tingling, and a fear of losing control or of dying. And then social anxiety is a fear of social situations or performance situations like stage fright, which goes on for over six months. And this anxiety is out of proportion with the threat that is posed from that social situation. Um, then you've got phobias, which we discussed in our question earlier, with the persistent fear um, that is excessive or unreasonable and caused by the presence or anticipation of a specific object. So they're targeted at one thing rather than all social situations, such as in social anxiety. And then you've got PTSD, which is after being exposed to something is life threatening, either to yourself or to somebody. Or it can also be about hearing it about somebody else or watching somebody else. Um, then they get intrusive symptoms with recurrent and involuntary 
memories of the event, um, nightmares, dissociative reactions and psychological distress uh, cues that remind them of the initial events. Um, these are persistent and they they have to go on for longer than a month after the initial event because if you it's deemed that before that it might be a normal reaction to what you've had to go through whereas after one month that's when they start viewing it as potentially pathological um yeah so now we've got the epidemiology of anxiety disorders so i found um, a study which suggested that 19.1% of Americans have an anxiety disorder or have experienced symptoms of anxiety disorders over a year, um, although I'm sure that the number who have actually been diagnosed with anxiety disorders is much lower than that, then it typically occurs in adolescence or in the early 20s, but can occur at any stage of life. Um, it more commonly occurs in women, there's a two to one ratio. And then uh, the course of the disease, it kind of waxes and wanes over life. So some periods will be very bad and some pe periods will be much better. And it's associated with a lot of comorbidities, such as depression, especially, but also any other chronic disease, such as diabetes, is also related to anxiety. Um, so what causes anxiety disorders? So I split this into four areas. So we've got conditioning, evolution, genetics and neural defects. Um, so conditioning is kind of that cognitive approach to anxiety as well. And um, by classical conditioning, we mean when you're associating one thing with another and then operant conditioning is associating a reward or something bad happening to a cue. So then you avoid it or you are attracted to it. Um, so class classical conditioning here would be fear conditioning and operant conditioning is the escape or avoidance of negative reinforcement. So that's when you've been exposed to something and something bad has happened, like a dog bit you, and then you see a dog the next time, you're then scared of the dog because of the association with the dog bite. So this is important to note because there's treatment options based on this theory, um, that repeated exposure to condition stimuli, so for social anxiety, that would be a social situation, then um, without adverse effects, i.e. embarrassment, uh, means that the stimulus loses its signalling quality and won't evoke the conditioned response of anxiety anymore. So if you are constantly exposed to social situations which go well, then you may lose your anxiety. And that's kind of a lot of the theory behind some of the treatments for anxiety. So an example of why they think this might work is the Little Albert experiment from the 1920s. It's definitely an experiment that we would not allow to happen anymore because um, a white rat was exposed to a little baby who was not scared of it, little Albert. And then they repeatedly hit a steel bar every time they showed Albert the rat, which would make him cry. And they did this over time so that eventually the white rat exposed on itself would make Albert cry, even though initially he wasn't scared of the rat. Um, and that finding was persistent throughout his childhood, so it had long lasting effects on him. So it's obviously very immoral for that reason, but it does demonstrate the point quite nicely. Um, so neural defects. So we especially look here at the amygdala and the ventromedial um, prefrontal cortex or VMPFC. Um, so uh, excitor, excitatory learning involves the amygdala and inhibitory learning involves the ventromedial PFC. And then in anxiety disorders, there's a hyper responsive amygdala and a hypo responsive ventromedial PFC. So that means that you potentially have more of that exc excitatory learning um, from the amygdala and the inhibitory learning from the ventromedial PFC. Then genetics wise, um, there's been lots of uh, genome wide association studies or GWAS studies, uh, which have found genes associated with neuroticism and behavior inhibition, which are kind of personality traits that are associated with anxiety, um, which may make you more vulnerable then to, to getting an anxiety disorder later on even though these personality traits on their own and not disorders but it's difficult to really make these associations because obviously not all people with these genes have anxiety disorders and not all people with anxiety disorders have these genes so the association is quite limited limited at this point 
So in terms of evolution, um, there's this idea that it is protective to be anxious of things because it, it's on a scale where you might be genetically of taking unnecessary risks, such as this man jumping off a cliff wearing one of those squirrel suits versus being afraid of things that actually aren't threatening to you. Shown here by the man being anxious of the social situation, which isn't threatening. So we can kind of view it on the, these are the two extremes of normal and they are a part of our normal genetics that would usually be there to protect us from doing things that are unnecessarily life threatening. And obviously those genes then become more prevalent because that's selection pressure. If you are a more anxious and person, you're less likely to die young, more likely to pass on your genes because you're not taking unnecessary risks. And then this anxiety has kind of evolved out of that idea. If that makes sense. Um, so your syllabus wants you to look at CBT, which is cognitive behavioural therapy for anxiety disorders. So the assumptions of CBT is that cognitive activity affects behaviours and emotions in the first place. That your cognitive activity may be monitored and changed, and that desired behaviour change may be effect, um, affected through cognitive change. So that just because you're changing the way your cognitions work, is that going to end up as a behavioural change and actually change the way that you feel as well? Um, so to do this for anxiety disorders, they tend to look at the harmful thought processes that may be leading them to having an anxiety disorder and then rationalising them. So, for instance, with somebody with social anxiety, you might be discussing why it is that they're afraid of social situations what is it about the social situa situation that they are finding um so fearful um so if you you might then detect that this person is struggling because they have a massive fear of embarrassing themselves in front of everybody that stems from one time years ago that they were embarrassed in front of people and you try and rationalize that maybe every social situation will not result in embarrassment and therefore could be a positive thing. So you try and change them. CBT also often involves you going home, doing homework. You'll have activities for the week which you need to be doing to try and integrate yourself more socially. Um, and then hopefully the idea is that you change the cognitions that have created the fear gradually until that person no longer suffers from anxiety anymore. So here was the example of OCD and the cognitive model of OCD. So a mix of early experiences and critical incidents then lead to assumptions and general beliefs that aren't rational, such as um, being able to wash your hands for four times before you leave the house will prevent your mum from having a car crash or something like that. Um, then, And those kind of lead to intrusive thoughts and images which... Um, are misinterpreted through these actions so that you then begin associating the fact that your mum didn't die in a car crash means that the washing the hands worked so they end up so then you're trying to look here and work out what of these is causing those that person to rationalize these irrational actions so you affect affect the attention and reasoning biases you look at the mood changes and um, you try and alter those so that they become more rationalised and to break that cycle. So does CBT work? So again, we've got a nice forest plot here. This is from Ola Tunji et al. 2013 and the references in my notes. So here it shows that CBT does work because in the forest plot, you can see that the little diamond is um, not crossing the one, which means that there is a positive effect of CBT when it's used for anxiety disorders. Um, so also I thought, I wasn't sure whether it was directly in your syllabus, but like we were discussing earlier with the behaviourist approach, where it's all about the conditioning of the person to becoming anxious, there are also treatments that target this specifically. So you've got systematic desensitisation therapy, where you ex gradually expose somebody to the thing that they're afraid of. So they particularly use this in phobias. So here's an example for arachnophobia, where at first they get the person to the patient to look at a picture of a spider. Then they get them to hold the picture, then see a fake spider, see somebody holding the spider. Then they have to hold the fake spider and then they see a spider in a container. They see somebody else holding the real spider. 
and then they hold the real spider and they learn gradually that the spider isn't going to cause them harm and it's kind of about gradually integrating it to break that old operant conditioning that suggested that there was something negative about the spider into something that is less threatening. There's also flooding, which is when you would directly expose the person straight away to a spider being on them and skip all of the other stages. But this is relatively immoral because obviously that person is incredibly distressed during this period. But the idea is that you can only hold that really anxious period for about 15 minutes and then it's going to go away and subside. So then the person will realise that they aren't actually in danger and that it is OK. But it's a bit more extreme. So generally systematic desensitisation therapy is much more commonly used. So also in your syllabus is improving access to psychological therapies or IAPT, which is an NHS scheme um, to use evidence based psychological therapies, routine outcome of monitoring and regular and out um, regular outcomes supervision. Um, it improves its the aim is to improve the access to talking therapies for people over five years, which is kind of a scheme from the NHS that's meant to increase the accessibility and the funding towards these areas, because as I'm sure you all know, mental health is very underfunded. So it's just targeted at stopping that. And I added a link in the notes so that if you wanted to read more about it, you can. Um, so now we're going to discuss some mood disorders. So we've got question two. Let me move on to that. So that is which of the following are risk factors for developing depression? There is more than one for you to select. So it's family history, being female, stressful life events, or high socioeconomic status, which is basically being wealthy. Fab. So you guys all got that right, um, or at least a couple of them. So the top three are all correct. So if having a family history of anxiety, uh, of depression does give you a risk of having depression yourself. Being female is does make it more likely that you'll get depression. And stressful life events also make you more likely to get depression. And being wealthy is not associated with depression. So question three, we've got um, in the neuroanatomy of depression, which of the following is true? The amygdala is underactive, the prefrontal cortex is overactive, the amygdala is overactive, or the parietal cortex is not active. Great, well done guys. So we've got a bit of a mix of results for this one. So the actual answer is that the amygdala is overactive. So if you remember that this is an area that kind of controls your emotions, the fact that it's overactive might suggest that you have more emotions than you're supposed to. Um, and the prefrontal cortex is more associated with reasoning. And I can see why you might think that that is overactive, but I think it would actually be underactive because it's meant to be controlling your thoughts and rationalising them, which obviously is happening less in depression, but we're going to go over that, so that's okay. Um, yeah, hold on. Okay, so classification of mood disorders. So here we've got bipolar disorder, which is the swinging of moods between mania and depression, kind of like we covered in our last lecture. And then major depression, which is kind of that stereotypical, what you imagine is depression, which covers all the major depressive symptoms, such as weight changes which can be an increase or decrease in weight sleep changes fatigue feelings of worthlessness diminished concentration obviously a low mood and that low mood needs to be most of the day almost every day for a period of six um, two months um, with diminished interest or pleasure in activities and it can also be related to suicidal ID, um, thoughts or ideations um, then it, your syllabus wasn't very clear about what mood disorders you needed to know, so I added a few more that I'd been taught about. Um, so we have premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is severe depression, irritability and tension before menstruation. So it's like a very extreme version of what many women experience before menstruation with 
premenstrual tension and then you've got seasonal affective disorder which is severe depression which occurs mostly in the winter time. The epidemiology of um, mood disorders this mostly focuses on depression but um, the onset is mostly in the mid um, to late adolescent period but again can occur at any stage in life. Um, gender balances more women than men in all age groups and then comorbidities are any other health conditions and anxiety. Um, so in this diagram you can kind of see the changes over time of depression and the time of onset. So at the bottom you've got childhood and you can see that kind of bulge in the shape of the graph which is showing a rapid increase in the early um, to mid-teens then the largest group where they're being diagnosed with depression is in 20s to 24 year olds and then for both genders that decreases and then for eight-year-old women it increases a little bit again so elderly people there's a slight increase again. Um, so what causes mood disorders? So there's a bit of a mix of demographics, social factors, genetic factors, biological factors and psychological factors. So demographics being things like being female, unemployed, from a low socioeconomic status or being single or divorced. And then social factors, stressful life events, daily stresses, childhood adversity and social relationships, um, genetic factors like family history, as we were discussing, biological factors such as the serotonin hypothesis, the HPA axis, your emotional neural uh, circuitry, like we were discussing with the amygdala, and then psychological factors, such as information processing, biases, distorted cognitions, and partly down to the personality. Um, cognitive, so the cognitive approach to um, depression kind of focuses on the negative schemas, so having negative biases in our overall cognition that then leads you to depression. So the things that contribute to this, your early experiences, genetic factors and personality all merging together to mean that you are more predisposed to getting this, these negative schemas. And you kind of need a little bit of a few of those causes to end up with depression. So then these negative schemas lead to um, stresses and then those lead to depression. Um, yeah. So the cognitive, a bit more about this. So you've got a couple of elements to what where the cognitions have been changed. So you've got biased attention where you're more prone to selectively attend to negative stimuli. You've got biased processing where experiencing, when they experience greater perception and awareness of negative stimuli. Then there's rumination where you keep thinking over depressive ideas. So you get fixated on something bad that happened and you keep thinking over and over again and can't get it out of your mind. Then there's biased biases in memory so that you recall depressive episodes disproportionately to positive experiences and then negative internal representations about the self the, and the environment which are dysfunctional attitudes and negative schemas like we we're discussing in the last slide. So all of these come together to create cognitions which are overall more negative, creating that sense of depression. So this is a bit of what we're discussing with the neuroanatomy of depression. So there's a difficulty disengaging from negative stimuli, like we we're discussing, which results in decreased activation, from decreased activation of the PFC. So usually that would allow you to control what you're thinking of and the executive functions that we discussed in the first lecture I gave you guys. So that is about being able to disengage and choose what you're attending to. So that would require more activation from your prefrontal cortex. So then you've got the ACC, um, which the activity indicates less inhibition of negative items. And then you've got more and more sustained activity of the amygdala, which is in charge of emotion control. And then you've got the Oh, my hippocampus is about wrong. Sorry, everyone. Your hippocampus, sub, subgenual um, cingulate cortex and your medial PFC are all hyperactive. And they think that that might be to do with rumination. Although I always think that with some of these things, when they try and narrow it down so much, 
to this one part of the brain does this one thing it's probably too specific and it's more about a circuit with all of these factors involved but it, if it helps you to remember it then you could definitely remember it like that so we're also going to quickly run over the serotonin hypothesis again we did do this on saturday but for anyone that wasn't there so the serotonin hypothesis is that there is too little serotonin at your synapses which causes depressive symptoms and then there's some arguments for and against this. So the arguments for are that you can treat serotonin levels in the brain using SSRIs, and these are effective treatments for depression, and reducing serotonin levels um, will induce depressive-like symptoms. And then arguments against it are that antidepressants might not actually uh, be modulating a process that's directly involved in depression, even if it does relieve some of the symptoms. Um, so we gave the example last time of paracetamol and how when you're in pain, we give you paracetamol, but we don't think that you, you're in pain because you're deficient in paracetamol. They're not actually directly related to each other in the same way. So, yeah, um, then we're going to focus a bit on CBT, so um, which focuses mostly on self schemas and on the way that you are thinking about yourself and situations that have happened and the way that you think about past events. Um, so it uses structured skills based and problems oriented approach. It modifies the thoughts, evaluations, attributions, beliefs and processing biases that you already have. So it's focusing on all of those things we were discussing earlier about the negative attention and the negative memories that are bring and the rumination. Those are all things that the psychologists will try and make you more aware of so that you're able to ch change those thought processes as they're happening. So that's the uh, identifying of maladaptive thinking. And then you evaluate how accurate those thoughts are. So when you're thinking about something that happened to you and you're thinking about it in this negative light, you then evaluate whether that really is how things happened or whether this is you overthinking or changing the perspective of it. And then you generate alternatives. So all the other things that could have happened and more positive outlooks and test out the effectiveness of these so that hopefully the thought is changed because the person, the patient might realise that maybe their thought process were flawed initially and that the other new hypotheses they've come up with are more logical and more positive, hopefully. So the strengths and weaknesses of CBT. So the strengths are that um, it doesn't require medications, which a lot of patients don't want to take because of side effects, because it makes their mood feel very flat, that kind of thing. It's, it is evidence based. There's plenty of evidence that, suggesting that CBT is very effective for depression. Um, and yeah, effective. That's the next point. Then weaknesses is that it's unclear whether cognitions are a symptom or a cause of psychopathology. So by changing your cognitions, are you really targeting what has caused it? So if the, or have those negative cognitions come out of the fact that the person was already depressed? So you don't know whether it's directly the cause. Um, it only focuses on a cognitive perspective and it ignores all the other ideas of how depression comes about. Um, and it also requires a huge amount of commitment from patients. Um, which some people may not be able to do. They may not have time to be able to put all of this effort in because it is it's more than just going to therapy twice, a, twice a week for an hour, which in itself is a lot of commitment. You also have homework to do when you're at home. You have to be constantly practicing it in order for it to be effective. So now we're going to focus on eating disorders. So we've got some more questions. Let me get to the right question. So which of the following describes bulimia nervosa? So A, restricted eating and overexercising, fear of weight gain and disturbed view of um, your own appearance, binging and purging behaviours with or without restricted eating and overexercising, excessive worry about weight and distorted body image with low self-esteem, or eating large amounts of food in a short period of time intermittently, often associated with obesity and low self-esteem. For a couple more answers. Fab. Well done, guys. 100% of you got that right. That's fab. Um, so, um, uh, question five 
are SSRIs effective treatments for eating disorders? So we're very split here. Um, the tiny minor, uh, tiny majority of you got this right, um, where it's false. So SSRIs aren't really that effective for eating disorders, especially for anorexia, where they find there's actually very little effect and it doesn't really help people, which I also think is quite interesting because you kind of think that it would work, but sadly not. Um, it, there is some evidence to suggest that it's more effective at treating um, bulimia because it's more bulimia tends to be more associated with depression and low self-esteem but overall there's not much to suggest the use of SSRIs to treat eating disorders. So to classify um, eating disorders we ha have anorexia, bulimia and binge eating disorder as our three predominant eating disorders. There is also the eating an eating disorder category for those that don't fit directly into one of these. Um, they all involve eating habits or weight control behaviour that is not secondary to any other medical condition. So in anorexia, it's the restricted eating and over-exercising. Um, it may involve amenorrhea, a fear of weight gain, disturbed view of your own appearance, bradycardia, alopecia and osteopenia. Then you've got bulimia, which is binging and purging behaviours with or without restricted eating and over-exercising. So not all of them display all of the symptoms in anorexia, but some will. And then there's excessive worry about weight and distorted body images with low self-esteem. Um, they also might experience symptoms to do with their excessive purging, especially if that's vomiting, with swollen salivary glands, tooth erosions and hypokalemia, which are all caused from vomiting. Some also purge by taking laxatives, which also have its own risk factors for and obviously taking huge amounts of laxatives regularly is not good for your overall gut health um, but these ones here are about vomiting and um, then binge eating disorder is the eating of large amounts of food in a short period of time intermittently over time it's often associated with obesity although not necessarily all people with binge eating disorder will be obese and it's also associated with lower self-esteem again it's important to note that officially the anorexia diagnosis comes is defined as a BMI of 17.5 or under, but this doesn't fit all patients and it doesn't fit all body, body types either. So just because somebody has presented and they aren't don't have a BMI of 17.5 or under does not mean that they cannot um, kind of they they aren't anorexic and it is a big problem in the medical community where this is part of the diagnostic um, criteria because many people slip through the nets who are incredibly unwell um, purely based on their body types initially um, so something worth thinking about so the epidemiology of eating disorders so in anorexia they think that 0 0.5 to 1 percent of all young women may have anorexia and 0.1 percent of males so clearly it's a bit more common in females than males it often is um, starts in teenage years again like many of these conditions it can happen at any time in life but teenage years are kind of the most problematic and then bulimia is one to two percent of all women but there's very little data on men it's much much more common in women than men um, it has a later onset than anorexia and is often much more associated with depression and self-harm behaviors like kind of like we were discussing with the SSRIs. Then for binge eating disorder, up to 2% of the UK population may have binge eating disorder, but it's very underdiagnosed. It's very hard to come up with good epidemiological data for that. Um, full recovery is expected in about half of the patients, but the mortality rate, especially for anorexia, is incredibly high. Um, anorexia is actually the most deadly of all psychiatric disorders um, with a huge number of patients dying from their condition, um, which is very tragic. So what causes eating disorders? So a lot of this is gonna kind of more focus on the restrictive eating um, in bulimia and anorexia. Um, so 
It's an overvaluation of control over eating, shape and weight that can lead to a restricted diet and other weight control behaviours. And then they think it leads to kind of a starvation syndrome with a preoccupation for feeling that feeling of starvation and it becomes obsessive and uh, very rigid and might result in social withdrawal and hunger but the starvation syndrome is the idea that it kind of feeds back into a cycle where which was originally made to for you to be able to survive in periods where there wasn't very much food so that you could keep going with that so you end up with kind of more feeling like you have more energy than you actually do um they're also the eating behavior the strict dieting and weight control can lead to perverse rewards such as social reinforcement where friends telling them that they've lost weight and that's viewed that um makes them very happy because that's one of the objectives and then emotional numbing or euphoria and a sense of virtue or specialness um all associated with those um, strict dieting behaviors which then feeds back to the over evaluation of um, of their eating and their shape and their weight and so it's kind of a, a cycle of cognition that causes them to, to reinforce these behaviours and repeat them um, like a vicious cycle. So I'm going to discuss a bit more about the cognitive explanation so there's altered introspection and reward processing it often includes um, certain, personality uh, certain personality traits with perfectionists um, people that are anxious, people that are a bit obsessive um, or poor at expressing their feelings or have low self-esteem, particularly prone to getting um, eating disorders. It's also um, people who have a family environment where there is dieting or a preoccupation with food in the household anyway. It may contribute to a child's future relationship with food. So if you have a mother that or father that diets regularly or is particularly preoccupied with healthy food, and that may affect a child's view of food later on and may lead some people to becoming more likely to get an eating disorder. But obviously, just because one of your parents is dieting in a house does not automatically mean that the child is going to get an eating disorder. It's just a predisposing factor. Um, and then often they find with people who have got eating disorders, they are more likely to have suffered sexual abuse in the past. Um, and it often happens around puberty, which is a difficult time, as we discussed in the adolescence talk a few weeks ago. Um, so all of these are kind of cognitive reasons why people are more likely to end up getting eating disorders and things that predispose people to having um, to getting these distorted cognitive um, cognitions. Um, so biological explanations. So for genetics, twin studies show that Identical twins or MZ twins um, have 65% concordance and non-identical twins have a 5% concordance, which suggests that there must be some genetic input. Um, in bulimia, there's 35% concordance in identical and 30% in non-identical, which again suggests that there should be some genetic uh, implication, but potentially less because there's less of a difference between those two numbers. And then there's also some evidence that there's altered serotonin and dopamine functions in those with eating disorders. Um, in terms of brain studies and fMRIs, um, they found that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which usually is involved in self-control behaviours, um, may um, be overactive in people with eating disorders. Um, the ventral striatum, which is part of the reward circuitry, may be hypersensitive to flavours and um, such a, that other people might find pleasurable, such as sugar, um, and the oversensitivity may affect somebody's enjoyment of food. And then the visual cortex is particularly um, active when thinking about foods. So if they're asked at the same time as people who aren't don't have eating disorders, um, to look at pictures of food, those that are anorexic will be, uh, their visual cortex will be much more active than other people. And then the insula may be involved, which is usually involved in self-awareness of the body states such as pain and hunger. Um, and the insula is the first brain region to register the taste of sweet things. In anorexic people, the insula may not correctly detect these signals and might be quite different, as you can imagine, in a in especially anorexia where 
the hunger impulses are completely suppressed by that person. Um, so in terms of experimental evidence, um, there's you've got Wagner et al, um, which is an fMRI study um, to show that anorexic patients do not modulate or show discriminatory, discriminatory responses between rewarding and aversive salient stimuli. Um, there's increased activity in circuits concerned with planning and consequences, focus on details, detailed strategies and concerns about mistakes. Other studies show increased ventral striatal responses to pleasant and aversive foods despite no differences in ratings um, in anorexic patients. So to treat anorexia, they often make a dietary plan for refeeding, which has to be done very slowly because of refeeding syndrome, which involves your electrolytes going mental and completely changing from what they're supposed to be if somebody is given food too quickly after a period of starvation. Um, eating has to be supervised to reassure the person and also make sure that they actually are eating what they've been given. Um, the aim is to also limit exercise because somebody with who has been restricting their food this much, it's not safe for them to exercise at the levels that often they do. Um, nasogastric feeding is obviously possible, but it's considered an absolute last resort and you don't really want to be doing that. And then in terms of psychological therapies, CBT is common, where again, they're gonna be focusing on the cognitions that are responsible for the eating behaviors. So the cause of how that eating behavior has begun and their thoughts around their own eating and the idea the, um, the weight loss is a reward and the starvation is a good thing. Uh, they want to turn those thought processes around um, so that the person is able to rationalise what is actually happening. Um, they can also use IPT, which is interpersonal therapy, and CAT, which is cognitive analytical therapy as well, like to other kinds of talking therapies. Um, they aim to disentangle eating from wider issues going on in their life. Um, they try to identify abnormal beliefs about weight and about food and encourage people to challenge negative thoughts, feelings, and behaviours with positive alternatives. And also family therapy appears to be particularly effective in this condition. So treatment of bulimia. So NICE guidelines kind of splits this into two areas with grade A and grade B. So grade A will involve specific forms of cognitive behavioural therapy, which a Meta-analysis found um, had a 37% chance of recovery with CBT, whereas if somebody is on a waiting list control, they have a 3% chance of recovery. So it's a significant increase. Um, and then in grade B, they use the interpersonal therapy um, with possible alternatives focusing more on relationships to other people or evidence-based self-help programmes and trials of antidepressants. And they try to educate the person about bulimia and try to establish normal eating patterns, they examine the mechanisms um, for their eating disorder, such as body image, um, how it began and the triggers for binging. And then they use some antidepressants which are less effective than CBT. Um, great. So that's everything I was going to cover. Are there any questions?